whether you're at a big organization or a small organization, whether you have a robust marketing plan or you're just one person wearing multiple hats, these concepts of storytelling are important and they're really powerful. Welcome. I'm Marissa DeSales, and I'm your host for What If, a podcast exploring the nonprofit sector. The What If podcast is a series of conversations featuring speakers from the Impact Foundry's What If conference taking place on April 12th and 14th. This is a space to dream and wonder and ask, what if? Welcome, Lynn Iorardi. I'm so glad you're here with us today. I really prefer for my guests to self-introduce so that um, they can highlight the parts of their identity that they want us to know about. Will you do us the pleasure of introducing yourself, please? Thrilled to be with you today and looking forward to the time when we can be face-to-face at the conference. (laughs) I started my career a long time ago as an attorney. And being a lawyer was something that I had looked forward to from my high school days forward. So being a lawyer was pretty cool. And I was doing that for about five years when all of a sudden my perspective changed. In 1993, my first daughter, Katie, was born. And all of a sudden being a lawyer wasn't quite as cool as it was before because being a mom was even cooler. It was the best job ever. And so I had to take a step back and reevaluate what I wanted to do. Those were days long before work from home, long before iPhones and Blackberries and all the tools that we have available today. So I needed to figure out how could I use the skills that I had acquired, the education that I had worked so hard for. I was in estate planning, estate administration, tax and real estate lawyer. What could I do with those skills that would allow me to better juggle career and family? And so I shifted gears and took some classes and did some more education in the field of development and fundraising. And lo and behold, I shifted over into fundraising. And here we are nearly 30 years later. And in that time, I've worked for a variety of nonprofits, some national organizations, some smaller organizations, health, higher ed. I spent some time with Merrill Lynch in their Center for Philanthropy, advising wealth planners and financial advisors around the country who had clients that were philanthropic. And then I took a job with the University of Pennsylvania. So for the last 17 years, I've worked for the University of Pennsylvania as well as my consulting work on the side. And I've been through two mega campaigns with Penn. First one starting soon after I joined Penn in 2007, we started a campaign that ultimately raised $4.3 billion. And then we recently closed a second mega campaign that raised $5.4 billion. What I specialize in is working with donors and nonprofit organizations on smart gifts. I call them smart because they are gifts that consider the big picture objectives, things like assets and structure and timing and working with donors, taking into consideration all of those things. What's the right asset for that donor to give? What's the right structure? Is it an outright gift? Is it a trust It involves a life income gift. Is it a bequest? What's the right timing? Is it this year versus next year? Has there been a taxable event like an income event or are you considering retiring? Has there been a change in your family circumstances? And then it's important to know that the reason that I look at all these things, assets and structure and timing is because the bigger gifts and the greater impact happen when you consider those three things. So that, in a nutshell, how I got to where I am today. Wow, that's a wonderful story. It's, um, you were sort of uniquely positioned by your combination of education and life experiences to enter the estate planning sector of philanthropy. 
Now, you've authored this wonderful book, Storytelling, The Secret Sauce of Fundraising Success, and all of our What If conference attendees will be receiving a copy of this book as part of their registration. And as I read through it, you highlight some incredible stories and the ways that fundraisers can use storytelling to advance their uh, fundraising goals. And it made me just a little bit more curious about you and your personal story. Can you share a little bit more with us about that? Oh, sure. I knew in my gut, based on years of experience, that storytelling is important. As you can imagine, in all these years of fundraising, I have sat in living rooms and restaurants and all sorts of circumstances with donors and nonprofit organizations, hearing many, many stories over the years, both the stories from those that are impacted by the nonprofit world, those that have supported the nonprofit organizations, and the nonprofits themselves, their stories. So I knew from all those years of experience that storytelling was important, but there were some personal Personal circumstances in the last few years that really brought things, you know, to a peak, so to speak, that made me think that this is important to share. This is information that's important to share. And I'll share a little bit more of that about that in my keynote and the work we do at the conference. But suffice it to say that I think of storytelling very much more broadly than most people think of storytelling. Storytelling is also about listening. So when I think of storytelling, I think about gathering stories as well as telling stories. And that's all about listening. And it's something that I think we as fundraisers sometimes forget to do and forget how important that is. So my expertise is in plan giving or gift planning. But what I realize is that this applies much more broadly. Storytelling is more broad, and this has broad applications. It applies to event fundraising, annual gift fundraising, all sorts of fundraising. And whether you're at a big organization or a small organization, whether you have a robust marketing plan or you're just one person wearing multiple hats, these concepts of storytelling are important and they're really powerful. So that's what prompted me to write the book, to focus on these things and share what I've learned over the course of the last 30 years. Wow, this I can't wait for your keynote. We're so excited to hear what you have to share with us. The keynote is taking place on the first day of the conference, bright and early, so if you haven't registered yet, uh, this is your chance to make sure you don't miss that. And it is gonna be followed by a workshop as well on storytelling, so. We have a lot of chances to learn more from Lynn about storytelling and how we can use it to raise more funds for the missions that we're all supporting. Now, Lynn, in your book, you describe storytelling as the secret sauce for nonprofits to achieve fundraising success. I really enjoyed the food metaphors in your writing because they serve as examples of how to integrate all the senses when telling an effective story. I mean, also, I just love food in general. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to ask, what is your favorite recipe? What food do you find most comforting in challenging times like these? And do you have a story associated with that food that you can share with us? Well, I'm glad to hear that you're a foodie because well, that means we have something in common because I'm a foodie too. I I really enjoy cooking. My husband is a great cook. My kids are great cooks. You know, they're adults now, but they're great, also great cooks. And uh, we really enjoy food. You know, it's a bonding thing for all of us, for our family. Family is important to me and food is a way that we share bonding experience. And I could share a number of recipes with you that are my favorites. I make a macaroni pie that is a recipe adapted from my mother-in-law she made macaroni pie and would make it for holidays and so I adapted that recipe and you know unfortunately she passed away several years ago so now I've taken over that tradition for various holidays I make a great chicken marsala And I have adapted that recipe for my daughter, who's a vegetarian, and I make tofu marsala, which is really awesome. Wow. So that's one of my favorite things to make because I can make everybody happy at the same table with the two variations, the chicken or the tofu. But the reason that I wrote the book with the food theme is because I wanted to accomplish two things with it. I wanted to share the important information, but I also wanted to entertain 
people mm. with the book. I didn't want this to be a boring tomb. I wanted this to be the kind of book that you could pick up when you're getting on an airplane. And it could entertain you for a couple of hours on an airplane. You could learn something from it, scribble some notes, perhaps use some stickies to put stickies on the pages and walk away feeling like that was both entertaining as well as educational. So that was my goal. And I wanted to appeal to your senses. So I'm glad to hear that it does appeal to yours. (laughs) And in the book is a recipe. So that's my favorite recipe is the recipe for the secret sauce of storytelling. I actually laid out a recipe in the book. Right. And it is. It, it's an entertaining book. It's a slim thing that fits in your purse and a very approachable, easy to read, fun. It's a fun book to read. And you can't say that very much about a lot of books about no. fundraising strategies. So, And uh, there are a lot of people that have, re- when I researched, was there a need for this book? Mm-hmm. I researched what other books are out there on storytelling. And there were a lot of books on the business side, the for-profit side mm-hmm. about storytelling. Storytelling. There were very few, there were a handful, but not many books about storytelling from the nonprofit perspective. Right. And there have even been written books written since I wrote mine. There's you know, a series now written by an academic, and he comes at it from the academic perspective. Hmm. But I'm in the trenches. I'm sitting across from donors. I was on the phone with a donor right before this podcast, having a conversation with a donor. I'm in the trenches, gathering stories, sharing stories every day. And that's what I wanted to share was, what do you do when you're in the field and in the trenches, rolling up your sleeves? How do you use this stuff? I really like that you're talking about gathering stories. It it almost evokes an image to me of a sort of a forager who, as they journey through, is stopping and going, oh, that's edible. Oh, that's medicinal. Oh, that's a beautiful flower. I'm going to just take all of these things respectfully and put them into my bag, and I'm going to take them home and transmute them into something magical. Right. So it's almost like us fundraisers have to constantly be in story foraging mode. Right. Absolutely. What a great analogy. That's perfect. (laughs) And as I I talk about, you know, respectfully gathering, I want to talk a little bit about the ethics of storytelling. So nowadays with rapidly evolving privacy regulations and really complicated ethical questions swirling around marketing and fundraising, it's more important than ever for nonprofits to focus on obtaining informed, empowered, ongoing consent from our constituents when we're telling their stories to raise funds for our missions. A story is a major gift, and it should be treated like one. Can you speak to some ways that nonprofits can prioritize ethical storytelling and stewardship of the story owners in the same way we currently steward donors? Absolutely. I think that's really important. I think it is part of the engagement of donors and part of the stewardship that we offer. So much of what donors offer us is not just what comes from their checking account, but it's their time and their treasure and their wisdom. And I agree with you that it is indeed a major gift when somebody is willing to share their story. So there is a simple form in the book, a consent form that you can use as a sample And then I think it's important to think broadly about, you know, sometimes there might be a need for workarounds. You might be sharing a story about a particular client or a particular person that your organization has helped, but it's not appropriate to share personal details or even a photograph of that particular client. So we need to be creative about workarounds. Maybe we use a silhouette instead of a photograph. Maybe when we're telling a donor story, very often it may be much more appropriate to share the story of the gift and why that donor felt it was important to make a gift, but it's not important to include the dollar amount of their gift. In fact, that can be counterproductive because if I share a story of a donor that made a gift with a dollar amount, Some people will look at that gift and say, oh, that's too much. I could Mm. never make a gift like (laughs) that. But there will also be people who will look at that gift and say, that's nothing. And they lower their expectations for what they should give. So sharing the dollar amount in a story about a donor's gift can really work against us in a lot of ways. Mm. 
So that's a good example of we need to think very creatively about how to share these stories and what's the best way. And not just stories about those that we help. Mm -hmm. We want to think more broadly about stories that demonstrate the impact mm -hmm. of the work the nonprofit is doing. Right. The donor stories, not just the organization stories, although that's important too. We want to be sure on our websites and in our materials, we're sharing the story of the organization. But we want to share the donors stories. Mm -hmm. Why did they make the gift? Why was it important? And how did they feel about the gift that they made? Because in the best of all worlds, we want a donor to feel good about their gift, whatever that gift is, whatever size it is, however it comes to us. We want them to feel good about their giving. Mm -hmm. And if we can capture that, capture that in stories about a donor's motivation and how they came to be impassioned about the organization they're supporting, if we can capture that, we can inspire other people to make similar gifts. Wow, powerful stuff. Well, Lynn, you're responsible, as you've said, for raising, being part of a team, leading a team for raising billions of dollars with your storytelling skills. And many of our listeners are young people entering the nonprofit sector early in their careers. Is there any advice that you would give to the young emerging professional considering how they can make the most impact? Sure. So I think back to my younger days as a fundraiser and think about what was important to learn and what was the best advice that I got at that point. And I would say, you know, obviously my focus is storytelling. Know your story so that when somebody says to you, what do you do? What do you do, you know, in your career? An elevator speech, you know, would you say I'm a fundraiser and I raise money for XYZ organization? Or could you tell that story briefly in a more passionate way? Mm. So if I asked you, what's your story? Are you prepared to share that? Mm -hmm. And then two pieces, two important things for, for young professionals to keep in mind. One is learn how to ask open-ended questions. Oh, I love that. Ask a question so that the person you're asking, whether that's a donor or a prospect or somebody you're sitting next to at a table, if you ask them a question, is it a question that they can simply say yes or no? Or do they need to share part of their story with you because you've asked an open-ended question? So that's number one. And of course, what goes right along with that is develop your listening skills. Right. The ability to hear and pick up on cues that will help you ask more of those open-ended questions and peel back the layers of the onion to discover that story. I remember one of my first fundraising visits. I was a brand new fundraiser with the American Heart Association. And I was going on a joint visit with my manager, my boss. And on, in the car on the way to the visit, she said, you're going to ask for the gift. And I started to sweat. I was like, oh my goodness. I, just, I had... I was I was a brand new fundraiser. I had taken the fundamentals of fundraising course and a few other things. So I understood in theory, <laughs> but I had never put it into practice yet. And so this was the first time. And what she said to me was, we're going to tell them our story. We're going to tell them about the American Heart Association and the work that we're doing. We're going to provide this donor with a call to action, mm. a how they can help us to achieve what we want to achieve. She said, and then you're going to wait. You're going to stop talking. You're going to pause. Mm. In other words, you're going to shut up. Mm -hmm. And she said, and we're going to ask him for $100,000. And I went, oh. and there was a lump in my throat. I was like, we're going to ask him for what? But we did. We went to the visit and, you know, she, you know, laid out a lot of what the Heart Association was doing and the kind of research they were doing at the time and how heart disease impacts so many people and what we can do to change that. And, you know, she handed the baton to me and I talked a little bit and then I asked him for $100,000 and I 
buttoned my lip and I sat back and waited. Was that the longest however many seconds of your entire life? It was. <laughs> it was, but it was a really valuable lesson to learn early on because as human beings, we tend to want to fill the time, fill the space, mm. respond, tell mm. them more about why, why, and how great we are and how great the organization is. And mm. we really have to work hard. We should be listening more than we are speaking. Mm. We should come away from a donor visit speaking less, listening more, mm. and gathering stories. And ultimately, that donor then we sat back and we listened and he talked about why heart disease was important to him, how it had impacted him and his family. And ultimately he did agree to do the gift. He agreed to it. So it was a really valuable lesson as a young fundraiser to you know, ask those open-ended questions, share the story, and then wait, sit back and let them respond. You know, there's a big difference between no and no, not now. And you need to listen for those things. Mm -hmm. So those would be, you know, my pieces of advice for young professionals just starting out. So <laughs> this one is kind of just for fun. <laughs> there's a Reddit thread called Two Sentence Horror Stories. And I admit to being that being one of my small guilty pleasures, which is weird because I'm totally not into horror at all. And I cannot watch any scary movies whatsoever. But anyway, just for fun, I wrote a two sentence nonprofit horror story. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe if you like it, you can share one of yours. Okay, here we go. Exhausted. The events manager slumped onto a folding chair in a closet to scarf down the paltry staff snacks at the $200 a ticket gala. Idly reviewing one of the stack of 2,000 event programs that had fallen off the smoking, evidently dead hulk of a printer, she suddenly noticed a small mistake. Misspelling of the names at the event's headline sponsor. So, oh, no. That's my... <laughs> as, oh, as, no. a, as an event fundraiser, that's, like, the scariest thing I could possibly think <laughs> of. Having pro home-produced in-house many, many thousands of pieces of paper that were, of course, ultimately destined for the trash anyway, but had to be perfect. <sighs> What's your best nonprofit oh, horror story? Oh my goodness! Well, <laughs> you know, and the, the mistakes happen to all of us. We all make mistakes <sighs> in, in in this work. We're human. You know, I think the key to that story would be how did you handle it and how did they <laughs> respond? But <laughs> so this was tough. You know, I horror stories are not something you tend to want to focus on. You know, when they happen, you want to, you know, let go and move on. But I did give this some thought and I thought of a real true story that did happen during the pandemic. I was sitting in the seat of a prospective donor and I listened intently on a webinar as this small nonprofit organization that supports women shared the details about the clients they serve, the tremendous need for the important work they do, and the impact that their work has in the community. But they wrapped up this powerful story during this webinar without a call to action and without telling the audience how we can help. Oh. So that's my story. And unfortunately, I think that's a very common story. We tell great stories in the nonprofit world about tremendous work that we're doing and important work that's having an impact. And too often, we leave out the most important ingredient, and that is the call to action. Right. So I was furiously in the chat <laughs> on this webinar, really, uh, because it, I, it was a great webinar. The, the work they were doing is, is so important. And they were wrapping up, you know, the, clearly it was the end of the webinar. They're wrapping it up. And I was you know, on the chat saying, how can we help? What do you want people to do? And they, fortunately, they saw the chat and they answered the question. Oh, you can go to our website. Here's the link to donate. 
that should have been built in mm. from it should have actually not just come at the end because they probably lost people during the webinar who signed off early or thought they you know needed to run to something else that should have been at the beginning in the middle and the end right where is the call to action and it's something that we fail to do too often mm, that is absolutely true well I have one more question for you, and this is the question that I'm posing to every guest on my show. Since the podcast is called What If, the question is, what if you could change one thing about the nonprofit sector? Well, I wouldn't be doing my book justice if I didn't say if the one thing I could change would be for nonprofits to use storytelling more effectively. Storytelling is not reporting. It's not listing bullet points of what we accomplished this year, how much money we raised, how many people we fed, how many events we hosted. Uh, I see that very often in annual reports, beautiful, glossy, great photographs, annual reports that simply report. Mm -hmm. That's reporting. It's not storytelling. So if I could change one thing, it would be that nonprofits become better at storytelling so that they can engage people, so that people can relate to what they're doing. They can create empathy with their stories, and they can create that call to action that is too often missing. Wow. Well, we really appreciate you joining us for this episode of the What If podcast. But more importantly, we're really excited to see you and hear you speak at the What If conference on April 12th. Do you have any parting thoughts or if there was sort of one thing that you're looking forward to about being in Sacramento? <laughs> yeah. What else would you like to share with us? Well, I learned something in preparing for this conference. I did not know that Sacramento has more nonprofit organizations than any other place in the country other than Washington, D.C. Yes, So I learned that, and I'm looking forward to connecting with so many of the people at those nonprofits. I hope that as part of publicizing both this podcast and the What If Conference, um, you'll share my contact information. My website is giftplanningadvisor.com. And if people have thoughts, feedback, suggestions about the book content, about the content of the podcast or the conference, I love to hear feedback because constructive criticism and input makes us all better. And I can do better things and bigger things with input from the other people. So I look forward to hearing from all of those nonprofit people in the Sacramento area. And if you come to our first day of the conference in person here in Sacramento, you can get, I'm putting this out here in hopes that Lynn will agree, you could get maybe a signing of your book and a little dedication. And maybe Lynn would be so gracious as to uh, chat with this. Are you planning to join us for a little mixer or will you not have Absolutely. time before the red eye? Oh, oh sure. good. Wonderful. Well, uh, I hope that you'll travel safely and I can't wait to see you at your keynote and your workshop at the What If Conference on April 12th. Thank you again, Lynn Iorardi. We really appreciate you joining us for the What If podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Marissa. This has been a production of the Impact Foundry. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, share, and give us a thumbs up. We hope you'll join the conversation live or virtually April 12th and 14th at the What If Conference. Whatifconference.org. Thank you.